I'm a CSI um, without the ray bands and leather jackets. Call the coroner because you're dead before anyone can help you. All right, well, I'm still not wearing pants. Good evening and welcome to Number One Crude Mistakes. I am James from Fix It Fingers, your not quite fake host for the night. And joining me as usual is KJ, Glenn and Havard. I've been invited on to join the shenanigans for this evening, so I hope you don't mind a slightly different and much more southerly accent. Hey, welcome, great. James. <laughs> nice welcome. to see you. Yeah, great to have you on board. Well, that, it's about as southerly as you can get, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure what the penguins sound like, but yep, otherwise that's pretty much us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great how, uh, how far the reaches of the maker community and podcast and that sort of thing is to be speaking with someone uh, so far in the future that it's tomorrow. It is literally tomorrow. We've been on like this new year for three days already. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad there's not any stock tips you can give us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lottery numbers. <laughs> so James, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, anyone who has uh, been fortunate enough not to come across me before, um, I met KJ because he was, for some godforsaken reason, uh, obsessed with Australian woodworking challenges. And <laughs> I, think pretty, I forget which one it was exactly. It might have been one of Sumo's challenges uh, quite a number of years ago um, yeah. when we did the scrap wood challenges and things. And we've got a fairly tight-knit woodworking community here in Australia, and that's where I slot into this. I am primarily a hobbyist woodworker, uh, traveling under the moniker of Fix It Fingers. And YouTube is my main platform. I'm on Instagram as well, but that's more just to stay in contact and talk to people. I don't sort of use Instagram in inverted commas to you know, grow a brand or anything like that. YouTube is, is, is where I live. Yeah, and through that, I, I met KJ and I do similar stuff to him without the metal work. Um, I also have a very small garage. I do not have the snow, uh, which is good. And I'm not quite <laughs> as obsessed with my balls, but uh, generally speaking... <laughs> I do, I do a lot of material based around being in a one-car garage that has to have a car parked in it. I live in a unit uh, with my family here in Sydney, Australia, and we have the garage and it is my uh, workshop space, but being a unit, it's my only car parking option. So the car has to get in at the end of the day, and that has really dictated the vast majority of the content on my channel. It's trying to fit as much woodworky stuff into that space. I think I worked it out. It's when the car's in there, it's only six or seven square meters of floor space plus the walls that I have to deal with. So uh, you'll have to convert that to freedom units if, if you wish. Um, obviously, when the car's out, I can wheel everything out and everything's on casters. But it took me five years to get a table saw, uh, which I only did fairly recently uh, because of that restriction. But I get a lot out of it. I said I don't feel like I'm lacking anything for that lack of space. Um, so that's uh, that's where I spend my time. It certainly it, doesn't it, seem to uh, slow you down on your content and whatnot, James. I mean, you still put plenty of stuff out there and make some really nice stuff. I try to. Um, for a while, yeah. I was getting the, the old one a week, um, but that was that was challenging and that was a little bit silly. Uh, yeah. Now I don't actually have a I don't have a schedule. I probably average two a month uh, when I'm getting out content, uh, depending on what I'm doing. But I, I get a lot of cheat content in as well. So between the projects, which as we'd all know, take a large amount of time. Uh, I get in the, the cheeky tool review or the tips sort of thing, which is much easier to film. And generally, to be completely honest, those ones do an awful lot better. Uh, the project videos <laughs> don't tend to do terribly good. They're, they're mostly for myself um, because I need them or I want them and that's what I enjoy. But if you know re review a Makita Brad Naylor, you suddenly you get you know 40,000 views on the thing and it does a lot better when it took you, you know, an, an afternoon to make that video compared to 11 months to make a dice tower. <laughs> that's so sad but i mean that's the situation we're living in uh, that's youtube i really feel you on the garage um uh, i have a single garage uh, myself but we have the luxury of uh, just <laughs> leaving our cars outside and i've got approval from the wife as well so i have a bit more floor space but that got me interested in what kind of car do you drive? Because we know that Glenn has his car, which we just renamed the tool chest because he has all his tools there. <laughs> so I was thinking, do you have like a small compact pickup truck or something? Because you then have a workbench included in <laughs> the center of your garage. 
No, I've got a 2009 Mazda 6. Uh, you guys over in Glensland would call them an estate. We call them a wagon. Uh, so basically, it's the sedan version of the car, but instead of still four doors, but it's still a hatchback, but it's got the extended roof. So it's you know big enough that you can sleep in it. I can fit a broken down sheet of plywood uh, in there, which I do um, and try not to destroy the leather seats, but the back seats fold down. So I've got almost the space that you would have in a covered utility vehicle. Uh, you just got to be a little bit more careful uh, about getting stuff in there, but it's, it's a brilliant car for what I need it to do because when I'm doing handyman work, which I do on the side a little bit, I can throw heaps of tools in there. I can fit half a sheet of plywood uh, in there quite easily. So it, it's a good vehicle for balancing between an everyday driver and being able to do some maker type stuff. But no, it, it just comes out and parks in front of the garage uh, when I'm working in the garage and I hope that none of my neighbours go by so I don't have to move it. <laughs> and you say you can sleep in it as well. Have you had to do that on many occasions? That's a, I've chosen something to. Something that happens when you fall out with the wife. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just a couple of the odd campy trip here and there where I couldn't have been bothered to set yeah. up set up the tent. Um, it was it was good enough to sleep in for a few nights. Yeah, no, I've set, hey, I've set hey. up camp in the back of my van a few times as well in the past. <laughs> And here I thought that you were going to opt for a smaller a smaller car to get more and more tools in. But if you use it for that as well, then that's not really an option. No, that's that's the challenge. The space, the space is good. The space breeds creativity. Like I think I've got another friend, uh, Anthony, from Barber's Paddock Woodwork. So I highly, highly recommend he's got a silver play button in his future. The bloke's been at it for under a year. And when I mean at it, I mean the hobby, uh, not just YouTube. He started YouTube yeah. about the same time as um, he started his proper woodworking I think he had a little bit of experience just going by what he did but the rate at which he came along has been amazing but th the point of difference is he built I think about a six by eight meter shed from scratch you know beautiful brand new just you know one of those kit sheds and then he has been able in that short period of time to fill it with all the tools and don't get me wrong he's doing an amazing job and an amazing idea I don't know if his wife would think he's doing an amazing job with his bank balance because he's spent quite a bit of coin on it. <laughs> Whereas yeah. I've, I've, I've taken five years, but because every single thing has to be considered uh, before it goes into my shed. I said, it took me four and a half years to get that table saw uh, when SawStop released their baby, baby version. They already had a baby version. It was still too big. Uh, they had to release a super small version before I could make it fit uh, next to the car and still be able to get the car in and out. So it breeds creativity in that you can't impulse buy things. Well, you can, but it's a really bad idea. Uh, yeah. you, you have to think about where is something going to live and do I absolutely need it before yeah. it makes its way into the shed? And it breeds creativity in the making side of things because for four years or more, I had to come up with ways to get around not having a table saw, uh, which is probably one of the first tools that most hobbyist woodworkers would buy. And a lot of my philosophy is also in the, uh, I don't like the term, but the buy once, cry once. So I've never really been a Ryobi kind of guy. When I decided I wanted to do this, I actually started as being a handyman before I got into the woodworking. But because I was starting as a business, I asked around my real trades friends and said, right, what do you use? One of my mates used Makita and swore, swore by it. So I said, yeah, I'm going to get trade level equipment. And I've kept that philosophy for just about everything that I buy. I, I try not to get the bottom end of the market because I can use it for work. That makes affording that sort of level of equipment better. But I have not thrown out a tool in five years due to breakdown or malfunction. Whereas I know people who went the Ryobi route, route and yes, they have a seven year warranty. You can walk back into the big box store and they will replace it straight away, which is fantastic. But then you've created landfill with you know a broken tool, which is never going to be repaired. And it also means you have to spend time replacing the tool or be frustrated with the tool. So the limits that have been placed on me have been really good uh, because it's made me consider my purchases, which means I spend less. Therefore, I can afford to spend more on slightly better quality tools. And then the tools sort of pay for themselves slowly over time. And I don't have to worry about the restrictions of having the wrong tool for the job or having a poorly made tool, which then ends up in the bin. So I think while space can be a limit, if you look at it the right way, it can be a very inspiring and beneficial restriction to have on your workflow. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking uh, of your tools, you have 
you have some tools that are named as well. <laughs> I have got a few, and now they have personalities, uh, which was kind of a little bit scary. I was, was going to get to that. That's that. That's that follow over. So the, the the naming of the tools first. Uh, when I qualified for memberships on YouTube, I never went the Patreon route because getting people to jump platforms is always terrible. I think you guys spoke about that before. You can get two million views on a TikTok, which is again something I've never yeah. done, um, and that can translate to you no know, zero views on YouTube, and it's. I've always just focused on that one platform and I didn't do Patreon. They released members and a few of my friends were very gracious enough, even though I told them not to, to jump on as members and people at a certain tier, I said, well, you can name a tool. <laughs> and uh, now in every video for <laughs> my, my members of a certain level, they've got naming rights for one of the tools. So it's not just, oh, I'm going to sand this. Kevin the sander comes out and he does. Then <laughs> I put a little animated pop-up of uh, the maker's <laughs> brand and their their head comes on the screen, except that their face has been replaced with their Makita tool <laughs> instead. So it's a bit you, of fun. Um, you have two nice friends. I, I could never do that. I, I remember when I went to the army and everybody named their rifle and so what, and I never really liked, oh, that's so tacky. And of course, if I would open up for my friends naming my tools, that would make for some inappropriate videos when I was going to reference those said tools. Now I'm going to take my beep to do some beep. No, no, I, I, I get to choose the name. But, uh, it's just named after themselves, either their brand, their brand, their YouTube brand, if they have one or, or their name, if they don't. But um, the main reason I ask my friends not to do it um, is because it's, benefiting google more than anything else like you'll get to the point where the channels that allow you to have active memberships you know i try to choose to support uh my friends financially where i can but if you're paying five dollars a month to them and google's taking a 30 percent cut of that and then they pay five dollars a month to you and google's taking a 30 percent cut of that <laughs> then the only person who's winning is google where you should just you know send each other some beer at the end of the year and, and call it done but um, that's all right. If they choose to want to waste their money on me, when you can get Netflix at a perfectly reasonable price, and you know that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's weird. I mean we we are really grateful for the platform that we're on, but I mean it is free, so so that they're that they're skimming off the top is, I mean it's fair in one way, but still it's a bit much, in one way. So it's it's a tough one that I think. It is. It's not for everyone. Um, my good mate, Mark Dana from Dana Made, he turned off his channel memberships recently. And he was, you know, he was making quite a, a reasonable amount of money a month. He was a, he's a very popular guy and he makes fantastic palette related content. And he just made the moral and conscious decision. And it made me stop and think to remove his channel memberships uh, because he didn't think that he was delivering value for the people who were paying him a couple of bucks a month. Uh, and that was just a, it was an interesting decision for him to make it. So he's gone the opposite way where he turned it on, was making a bit of extra money on the side doing it and then decided, you know what? No, um, I don't feel comfortable doing this. So it is a decision that just because you can doesn't mean you should. I've thought the same, but I sort of asked a few of my members and they said, no, look, we don't care what you do. We just want to support you. Uh, and I suppose it's a bit of swallowing your pride um, and going, well, if someone wishes to support me, then why should I say no to that and it's it is definitely a balancing act it's not for everyone but it's um it, it's lovely it, it, it's hard it's one of the harder things as a maker on youtube that i've done is is turning that feature on and then accepting financial benefit from people who i some people i don't know and they never comment on my videos and i'm just grateful for them to be around but most of my members are people i say are friends and so whenever i see them i'll try to pay them back in beer <laughs> I think that, that probably says a lot about the Aussie maker community. I mean, I, I feel that the maker community in Europe is pretty strong, but it doesn't seem anywhere near as tight as you guys. You've really got it sorted. You've really got each other's backs. You know, you all appear in each other's videos. And like you say, you look after each other through memberships as well. I think it's a really nice situation to be in. It is. It's. Um, I've had this conversation with a few. I think in America, they have a bit of a problem with numbers. Basically, it's hard to build a small community when you are not a small community. Like you have a huge continent. Australia and America geographically are roughly the same size, coast to coast, east to west. But in Australia, you have 28 million people 
and in New York, you have 28 million people. Okay. Um, I think, what, 350, 400 million uh, across America or something like that. So the fact we're geographically isolated from the rest of the world, but also our population is still relatively small, uh, like what, London, would, Glenn, would easily be bigger than Australia, wouldn't it? Right. Maybe, yeah, I it's... Um, Somewhere I don't go. <laughs> yeah. It's too busy. Too busy. Well, that, uh, that's the thing. Yeah. So because we have that smaller community and therefore a smaller group of woodworkers and makers it probably makes it a little bit easier to be tight-knit because we have those defined boundaries whereas in the states you know where do you draw the line within your state well the next state might be 20 minutes away so that that doesn't make any sense or it's and you have thousands upon thousands of woodworkers and and things over there so i think it's probably harder for them and then for you guys you tend to you know english being the bastard language of the world aside have a language barrier (laughs) where you're you know you might be um speaking to someone and yes i feel sorry for you the people who don't have english as a second language because you guys have had to learn that on there but as you three have demonstrated it's no real barrier because most europeans are much better than english speakers and actually bother to learn uh, our language whereas english speakers are the laziest people in the world yeah yeah, yeah absolutely we're uh, we are going to do the swedish and norwegian versions of this podcast soon <laughs> I just, need, you know, just need. Oh, my wife! My wife 15. wanted to know, Havard, um, what what ranking are you up to on the Norwegian comedy podcast? Uh, <laughs> have we gone well, up from 121? Uh, we haven't checked lately. We just uh, we're resting on our laurels, like we are in the 120th uh, <laughs> group. <laughs> Does your wife listen as well? No, no, I just pass on the highlights. Uh, <laughs> She's just make here a summary. The that's why. I see ya. I just thought our listener count had gone up to four. Then, <laughs> or she might be able to join that said... exclusive, uh, you know, temporary host wives club. Although yes. listening to you three blokes wife swap every week, I'm not sure if I want to get involved with that. <laughs> just get a bit weird at times, doesn't it? <laughs> No, they did, they so, did say the the maker community is like a family. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we took it took it too far. <laughs> <laughs> They're different kinds of families. But yeah, as you said, the 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 Australian maker community is really friendly because, as you said, I just more or less forced myself into it back in. <laughs> I, I had to I had to look look uh, look up that it was back in uh, 2020 when I think it was. Al, who mentioned Sumo's projects, Sumo's Scrapwood Challenge would be 2020. Podcast. Yep. Yeah. So I, I I looked him up, and and that was just about when he announced the Scrapwood Challenge. And I thought, oh, this sounds like fun. I'm gonna try it. And then, <laughs> I mean, you really reacted nicely, having a Swede forcing his well way into your community, more or less. And I joined a couple of uh, this one. It was a lot uh, of uh, scrap Scrapwood builds. And that year, I think it was at four of them or three. I don't remember. It was a lot of them, at least. And you were all, it was, I mean, uh, you were more or less flooded with nice comments from everyone because there were so many people taking part in them as well. So that was, it was really, really nice. It You're is, a, g- generally speaking, though, the community is really nice and supportive. And in those challenges, we went through a bit of a purple patch around that 2020. Um, it sort of died off a little bit post COVID, but. For a while, it was semi-organized that we had one a quarter. So the the spring challenge, the autumn challenge, the winter challenge, summer challenge. And that went on probably for a year or two. And we organized taking it in turns that a different maker would host a challenge. And um, they did start to get a bit out of hand um, because they started off very fun. Um, And then, again, hard to argue if it's a good thing or a bad thing, the... A few of the, the makers like myself who have affiliations with uh, brands and tool stores um, got sponsorship and there was started being small prizes uh, like of financial value uh, attached to them. And then I think while that was wonderful, it might have also killed it um, and why they don't happen as much because you had to be a maker of a certain level to have that relationship with the tool stores to be able to offer those prizes. And it was then became intimidating for smaller makers who didn't have access to those resources to then host a challenge because they thought they were expected to have a couple of hundred dollars worth of prizes for them. So if anyone is out there thinking of, of doing things that are similar, do be cautious of having monetary prizes because the challenges were great. They grew our community massively. People like KJ and uh, he wasn't the only one, we had lots of people from overseas 
who I I've now consider friends, I met through those challenges. But ultimately, they, they've pretty much died off. And I think that commercialization of them, while good at the time, was one of the reasons. So commercialization can affect community and, and do be aware of that. It's, it's lovely to have prizes, but if you keep it fun or have the prizes being something very nominal and, and meaningless, then you can probably run a better challenge would be my experience coming from that. I might have seen something along those lines. I mean, the maker community to me was an epiphany because I come from a, it's not even a town. It's a small dwelling of houses or whatever you call it. And of course, if you're one of those who stand out in the crowd or do things a bit differently, you are very easily labeled. And of course, I was the one with all the crazy ideas and of course, making them uh, on my uh, <laughs> free time. And then stumbling into the maker community was an epiphany because, all right, there are other peoples out there who has crazy ideas and then go down and try to build them. And then, of course, venturing into YouTube, I also found that there are people out there who enjoy that hilarity, even if they're not makers, but they are supportive in the, the way that they're commenting and actually interacting. So it's it's been really good, but I see now that a lot of it feels like it's been just the last three or four weeks. But on Instagram now, it's it's just ads, and a lot of the makers that I follow, they are fallen into like a template that they need to do because that's what everybody else is doing, or it's the platform demanding it of them. So trying to break that mold as you said with the challenges uh, not too many rules uh, not uh, doing the monetary route or the affiliation to companies and so on maybe that's a bit about going back to the roots trying to keep people engaged again because i feel someone is like if it's a competition right off the bat and you feel that, all right, I need to bring my A game and a thousand dollars worth of tools and experience just to have fun, then you lose 80% of the people. And I think that's what it's about. It's, it's having fun and together with other people sharing ideas and <laughs> stupid as they may, but having fun <laughs> doing that. Um, maybe that's the, the core of it all. I think it's 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 very true, and uh, nothing against uh, Tim Turgworks, our friend, who I'm sure might have some words to add uh, later on in the episode. Um, he runs his Scrapple not. Challenge every year, <laughs> and he's obviously got his affiliations with Rubio, and he offers some prizes for that too. But it, it's very interesting um, what you say about the balance. It's something that you know you have to remember that all of us, Jimmy Deresta down, April Wilkinson down, nearly all of us started with a garage and a couple of tools you know people had maybe a bit more experience with them when they started their youtube but i think very few people pick up a saw head on to youtube with a camera and go i am going to be a person who builds a massive brand and gets commercialization on the channel and ads on the channel and nordvpn asking to give me money to put in random ads <laughs> you know i don't think many people set out with that and even if they achieve that you have to remember that they are just pretty much like you. They, they are just a person in their shed or in their workshop, wherever they happen to be doing their making. And all of these things come on slowly. Generally, there are breakouts, obviously, people who do it in a very short period of time, but it, it, it is creep. And when you get to that sort of level where you start getting approached by companies, it's very, very easy to accept everything. Uh, and that's it's a big trap because you start getting obligations put on your time and therefore obligations put on your content. And like I'm offered a laser every day, like um, without exaggerating, I reckon one a week uh, for the past year or two, a laser company has reached out and said, we would love for you to have this free, sometimes very expensive laser. And I've just knocked them back constantly. And they don't seem to understand why I've said no to what is a very generous and, you know, lovely gift. It's just that I can't use one. I mean, I could, but I don't have time. I have so many plans already. I have very limited space and I can't in good faith accept this tool off you because it's going to sit around for so long. I'm never going to be able to fulfill my commitments. And if I do fulfill my commitments to you in making content based on your laser, then it's going to be half-hearted and, and terrible. So I just say no. 
but when you're just starting out, that can be pretty difficult. And it's striking a balance between doing those commercial uh, slots on your channel and not. And, you know, I, I have my permanent affiliation. I'll give them a plug with it because it's only in Australia anyway, and no one from Australia is going to hear this really, is uh, Carbotech is one of our big woodworking shops. And I'm very lucky to have a, an ongoing affiliation with them. Uh, and a lot of my content will obviously feature their stuff because I've bought so much stuff off them over the years. Uh, and my table saw was gifted to me. And that was a $2,000 saw stop, uh, which I did not pay for. And I you know, am forever grateful um, that I have that off them. But you have to get your, your content buckets right. For every video that you do exclusively for paid content, there should be a couple that are for yourself and some that are you know, just that much more natural content that you made for the reason that you started the channel, which is not, hopefully, to sell out to tool companies. <laughs> do you remember the first thing that was offered to you, James? I do. Um, yeah. Yep, yep. The very first thing, again, it was from Carbitech. Uh, I've had a very long going relationship. So I got into nice. the Craig brand, uh, thanks to Steve Ramsey from Woodworking for Me Immortals. They should be paying that man a million dollars um, because they, I said, they're, they're like Makita. Uh, Craig is not cheap. Uh, I've heard particularly in Europe, it's, it's particularly not cheap. Um, but it is exactly designed for the person with limited space who is a hobbyist woodworker. So that really fit in with my style of woodworking. I'm a big pocket hole aficionado. Uh, and I did a lot of videos on them because I quickly found I bought that stuff from Carbotech. But the Craig videos did very, very well because they're such a popular brand. A lot of Americans search for them. And so my setup videos did great. And so it wasn't too long um, after getting some success with those that Carpetech reached out to me and said, hey, would you like a, a K5 pocket jig? Uh, I think was it basically. And um, that was the first tool for content exchange that I did. And it sort of the relationship with the company blossomed from there. It always feels like the, that you're, you're in a really good spot when it comes to sponsor, sponsorships because... All the stuff that you use, as you say, the the Craig stuff and the Carbotech things, that it it really feels genuine because it's this is stuff that you would use anyway. You just happen to have a a professional relationship with the with the brands as well. Well, and that's it. That's where all of um, my stuff comes. And I said that's that's a restriction I put on myself. I've broken it once or twice. I did a video for Banggood uh, finally, um, and again, it was because I did need something. But all of these companies uh, who approach you, they generally offer you like a 20 to 50 or $100 uh, tool um, for the international listeners. One Australian dollar is about 60 euro cents and maybe uh, 50p uh, over in Britain. So you can halve that for pounds. They're not very expensive is what I'm getting at. And you know, to make a five minute video on them would take me hours and hours. So it's not worth the exchange of a $50 <laughs> tool yeah. for a five minute video unless I really want the tool. And so I finally made the mistake of accepting a Banggood tool, even though I didn't really want to. I could have bought, it was a um, sliding square, uh, combination square. I could have bought one from my big box store to replace my old one for $20. But I said, no, okay, I'll take one. And it was a nightmare. It was a piece of junk. Uh, and I made the video saying that it was a piece of junk and then figured out I was using it wrong and had to make a second video saying that it was not quite as big of a piece of junk as I thought it was. Um, yeah, that was the first and last time I took a sponsored deal just because I could. <laughs> um, yeah, I went back to it. So no, I think if, if you are going to take on sponsored content, be aware that your audience will probably understand but be genuine in what you're doing. I do the Craig stuff and I do the Carbotech stuff because I spent years and many thousands of dollars buying their stuff and genuinely liking the brand and genuinely using the tools. And I, I don't do sponsored stuff unless it's something I can see living permanently in my workshop. I won't take a laser, do a video on the laser and then sell the laser just, just to do that spot. I don't see any value in doing that and nothing against people who do uh, everyone you know has different goals and ideas for their channel but if i'm going to do something with a brand i want it to be something that i enjoy something i need and something that has a very good chance of being a permanent fixture in the workshop i, I fully agree with that and i understand the commercial aspects of it but if it's like you say if there is a tool that you would use anyway it's very much easier to implement it in the video so it's like a seamless 
transition. Unless it's like, uh, as you said, NordVPN or the tank game or whatever. If you're doing a woodworking video, then there's a, like a hard cutoff and then you're plugging some video game and then you just continue. I mean, it's more forgiving if someone is plugging a work- woodworking tool whilst doing woodworking and then talking about it. And of course, as a subscriber i understand that you need to do it but it's it's pleasant to see when someone actually can pull off like that seamless transition where it feels like it's a part of the video like organically rather than something you you can actually see it on the person like oh my god i need to do this and they do like a five minute like scripted piece and then they continue that's the thing where i skip so of course it's more beneficial for everyone if there is something mm. that's related to the content because then you sit through the like ad if you can call it mm. that. I mean that's building your brand as well as being someone trustworthy who doesn't sell out for anything. I mean look at Tom Scott for instance. I mean his his brand is so solid that I mean he can make any terms for this kind of sponsorships he takes. Uh and that's because his He's always been very hard on not not promoting crap and not not doing mm. the raid shadow legends and that sort of thing, but being being true to what's what's reasonable. So I think that's good. But it's I mean it's probably hard to to say no when when people come with I mean not buckets of money but but still something. You'd be taking that laser, wouldn't you, Avard? <laughs> oh yeah, I was gonna say that, to James. <laughs> when you're logging off here, if uh, if you feel it cumbersome with all the people wanting to give away a laser, you could. Uh, I I, I can give you an address. That. I know a guy. <laughs> I, I I almost thought because a lot of these, um, shall we say, they're not the most. I'm not going to say they're unscrupulous companies, um, but a lot of you obviously have companies and you have companies, uh, and you have a lot of. Um, more generic companies and one of the other is I don't like dealing with Vanguard is because while they they are offering a place in the market they are blatantly ripping off other tools they literally um, you know see a tool made by a branded uh, woodworking company or I'm sure they do with other non-maker related stuff too and then they make a nearly exact replica they're like the Audi of you know the, the tool tool making world and um, I don't know how bad Audi is here. I don't know how they get away with it in Australia. Like you have Nutella, obviously, you know, world famous brand, world famous packaging, and then you'll have Natino from Audi, and it'll yeah. be the same colours, same <laughs> font, but just different enough that they don't get sued. Yeah. Um, and I, I find that those knockoff manufacturers, ethically, I just don't like dealing with it. Um, and some people go, well, you know, Woodpecker's charging $600 for this square and you can get a one that's nearly as good and almost as good for $60 from uh, Timu or, you know, uh, Banggood or somewhere like that. And like, that's fine. But if they just made it and made it a different color and a slightly different style, that would be brilliant. That's their own product then, even though they're copying a design. But when it's absolutely the same color, the same sort of packaging and styling, and then it's it just doesn't feel right to me. So it's one of the reasons I don't like those guys. And I thought of, okay, what I should do for three or four months is accept every single laser that is offered to me, regardless of what it is, you know, big, small, <laughs> whatever, take all of them and then just give away, not, not do the content, <laughs> just give away all the lasers to people who, who genuinely want one and want one and need one and would like to use it. And, um, then get back to the company and say, oh, sorry, I just didn't have time to, uh, to do that content. Or just make it clear to them saying, look, I, I might use this laser. Send it to me at your own risk. <laughs> and then just give Christmas that presents. Sounds like a good idea. I think um, going back to the Woodpecker example, the, I think that's the problem that maybe YouTube's partly responsible for, though, isn't it? You know, you see Bourbon Moth with that big wall of red tools and you want that, but you certainly don't want to pay the price. And I think that's probably where that problem's stemmed from. Mm. One of your countrymen, Glenn, a uh, friend of mine, Ben, from Hue and Awe, uh, he does yeah. a lot of, um, first of all, brilliant, beautiful, masterful woodworking. Do go check him out. It's the stuff he makes is far beyond yeah. what I'll ever achieve in my lifetime of tinkering. But he, funnily enough, despite doing fairly fine woodworking, he's a big fan of the band good style stuff and like he he's the one who has sort of alerted me to the well it's, we've got it out of the bag the woodpecker knockoffs and we've had quite an interesting conversation about why he has a different opinion to them and me and why he doesn't want to pay you know 
so much money because of the brand exploitation where his view is, um, forgive me, Ben, if I'm wrong, but, you know, Woodpecker are charging what they charge because they can. Like they're charging, it's not because they need to charge that much for the quality of product they're making. They're charging it based on their brand, which I'm sure is universal across all things, not just making. Whereas Banggood can show you can make an almost identical quality tool and sell it and make a profit at a much lower rate. So there's there are arguments both ways in doing it. And um, so it is it is an interesting thing that doesn't have a, a proper answer. And there's no right. If you like Woodpecker, go out and spend $600 on the square. If you want to buy the almost as good, you know, knockoff one, then go on up and do it. It's just, it's a personal choice of, of where you lie on that field. That was a fun realization when I, when I went to university because I studied product development and design. And of course, in parallel, they also had like a, a line for entrepreneurship and they had like a half semester of uh, intellectual property rights. So me and a friend, we thought, well, maybe we should take that as like uh, extra curriculum to what we were studying. Uh, of course, that class being 95% girls had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but of course, I remember the professor taught that a lot of the, the knockoffs in many cases are made by the same factories. Mm -hmm. So let's say they're doing two shifts where they're producing for Craig tools. And then, of course, they run the third night shift at the same factory, knocking out the same tools, but just slapping on some generic names. And I've seen a few examples of that where you can get the same tools, but of course, without the brand to a fraction of the price. And of course, it's nice because you know that the the markup on the tools are basically very much tied up to the brand. And of course I feel for the brand because that's also why I, what I've been taught in university studying product development. Uh, so it feels kind of bad uh, going for the cheaper option when you know there's a factory there ripping that brand off. So, I've tried to, and I think I mentioned this earlier, when I buy tools, I buy the proper ones because you have the buy once, cry once. But I say, when I buy a tool, I buy a tool that will be my children's problem <laughs> one day. <laughs> when, when I turn in my slippers, they will have to figure out what do we do with all these tools? <laughs> because I think if you buy proper tools once, then you can keep them. Of course, there's no problem breaking <laughs> tools, but... There, there is something about not uh, producing to a landfill. And, yeah. uh, and they still yeah. have a good uh, resale value as well. Or yeah, that is well. I've, I've bought tools where I realized I'm not using this uh, half as much that I thought. And if you have a proper brand, it's easier to make the money back selling mm -hmm. it. If it's nicely used and you keep the receipt and the box it came in, then you can mitigate your losses. Yeah. My wife has a master's in, in IP as well, which um, sort of helps keep me on the straight and narrow. But I think there's there's two of our, there's There are the tools that are made in the same factory. And I've got friends here in Australia who make a dovetail jig, the Gifkin's dovetail jig, beautiful piece of engineering. Um, obviously, it's still made in Australia, uh, but they do research overseas. And he's, uh, one of his guys went over to investigate having it made overseas in a big factory. Uh, and sure enough, uh, when he was over there, there was already one of them sitting in a special room out the back with a whole bunch of other tools in various states of being pulled apart for them to retro engineer <laughs> them. Uh, yes. And luckily for him, because they're a small Australian company, the, the, the developer must have just thought that it wasn't currently worth it financially to copy his particular tool, uh, his particular jig and sell it yet. But it just shows you what they're their voracious reach is if they'll go to a small country and you know halfway around the world and find a relatively very very good but you know um niche product like a dovetail jig and think about copying that and developing it and selling it on one of those big big sites it's it's scary in a way um but you know you also get the fact that a lot of these tools as you said are made in the same factory um like carbotec there's absolutely no secret um carbotec's main line of blue machinery their dust extractors their table saws a lot of those things are made in taiwan and they're made to a very good quality and one of the things that does give me the 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 shits if we're allowed to say that here is people who bag stuff just because it's made in china rolls royce is made in china yes you can get the british made ones but you can also get a chinese made one and it's just as good quality 
like anything, you get what you pay for. There are a lot of rubbish. I don't think the British have a good track record on uh, (laughs) putting together (laughs) uh, high quality, low maintenance uh, cars. So we we might not want to go there. We won't get into the fact that most of the Rolls is actually made in Germany, moved to Britain and then assembled, but uh, we'll leave that alone. Um, (laughs) So what I'm saying is that this company, uh, this factory that makes Carbotex very good quality machinery, they also have a spray booth where they put orange paint on it and they make it for Timbercon, who is the other big Australian woodworker. And funnily enough, you go to their websites and you will see my dust extractor, which I have a video coming out next week on, and it is identical. The the two of them, the red one, the the blue one and the orange one from our two biggest companies with their own branding on them, they are identical from the same place. And I guarantee you there'd be that same dust extractor under a dozen different brands in different colors, different branding all over the world. There's no deception there. It's, it's no marketing stunt or gimmick. It's just that these people make a very good machine and then they sell it out instead of under their own name to smaller companies to put their own brands on. And, you know, that's, yeah. it's, it's, there's, there's just so many different variables when it comes to the quality of the tool and whether it's a knockoff or whether it's just, you know, manufactured under license. You have to find where your dollar is going to lie and at what price point you are happy. Yeah. And I also think that one of the more important points, which I've been more and more happy about the older I've become and more experienced, if that's the right word to use, but I like to use not only companies, but tool manufacturers that has a local representative or an affiliated shop or something because as a maker you would like to have that relationship with the tool provider that they know the urgency that you are under sometimes like i i had my cnc break and of course uh, a lot of people said well why did you pay so much for one that you could get for half the price if you just assemble it yourself but i could pick up the phone and call them and say i have this problem it's doing this help and I have something I need done by tomorrow and they actually have technicians that are just calling you send me the files and we'll examine them and they go through them and they say all right we we seem to have discovered some irregularities here and they can fix this on the go and that is what you're paying for very often if you run into a mistake and if if your tools is what you do especially for those using tools for a living you can't wait for three weeks to maybe get feedback from a company offshore or something. So that's the same thing I'm looking into now when I'm looking into getting a laser. I'm mainly looking at companies that are stationed in Norway, which can deliver. And of course, I could get it a fair bit cheaper, order it directly from the States or something. But then there's no one to call whenever a problem arises. And then I'm just left to chance whenever I get a reply and a fix. Are there many Norwegian laser manufacturers out there? (laughs) Oh, plenty. Um, (laughs) I know there's a company not far away from here that they made them their own until they got a link with uh, the Myra lasers, which uh, Manga sister and bought one of, but they don't have to make them, but if they are a part of a distributor network, Mm -hmm. uh, they can tap into the uh, original, don't know what it's called, but uh, the manufacturer of priv- privileges where you get uh, the help when you need it and they have the parts readily available. And of course, the, the parts that most often break, they have on the shelf within the country. So you don't have to wait for a month to get them. If and when I finally do get a CNC, there are a couple of good, small actually Australian made and that's getting very very difficult because we're a small country we don't have much manufacturing capability so like you can't buy an Australian made power tool they just, they just don't exist um, but at a few things like the CNC's there I've got a couple of options and I most certainly will be going even though they're probably twice the price be getting my CNC when I do fit one in from an Australian manufacturer because as you said you get that phone call support you get someone who understands your wood it's really funny, like even my beloved Craig stuff, Americans do not understand Australian wood. Uh, we have, on average, some of the hardest, stupidest concrete rough 
wood in the world. Like our average yanker on, on, on a eucalypt is so far beyond maple and walnut. They've got hard maple. I'm going, yeah, that would be a soft wood in Australia. Um, <laughs> no, oak, none, and, <laughs> I, I made a bench from spotted gum and some. I had to pre-drill the pocket holes. So normally, you know, if anyone's used a pocket hole jig, they've got the screws for hardwood, but have got a slightly finer thread, which is meant to stop the wood from splitting. They do not work on Australian wood. I can absolutely guarantee you have to drill the pocket <laughs> hole, then get a really long three millimeter drill bit and continue the pilot hole. Otherwise you're going to have a very, very bad day out. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Not, not to fault them. The people who designed these things just did not expect wood to be made from concrete, but that's how we roll down yeah. here. Um, so <laughs> it's just baked hard, isn't it? Uh, it's the same. So when you have um, a CNC, you know, having a person who goes, I'm trying to mill hardiest vicarious uh, on my CNC, can you help? And they will actually understand what you're trying to do and why you need a six flute carbide bit because you have no hope otherwise of getting through this timber. <laughs> so local local is important to me. I try to buy a lot of tools off my maker friends. Um, so if my friends are making certain hand tools, then I'd rather buy a mallet off one of them for you know three times the price because I know it's been lovingly crafted in a backyard workshop than buy a, a twenty dollar mallet off the shelf at the big box store. It's if you can afford to do that. And I think what Havard said as well is quite important. I'm a hobbyist. Yes, I make money off my hobby, but I'm ultimately a hobbyist. I don't tend to have those hard deadlines. Whereas if you're using your laser or using your CNC to produce a physical product and that is your business, then even more so that local support is absolutely imperative to be able to keep yourself working yeah definitely what are those um, hardwoods like through the table saw i mean i push some slightly hardwood through my table saw and i find it a bit snatchy and it wants to throw it back in my face and how are your how do you how do you cope with that with your concrete woods so i've run uh red gum which is one of those incredibly hard things through my uh cts that's the compact table saw from saw stop which was given to me by carpetech plug hash plug um and it <laughs> it chomped it it absolutely chomped it that's a you know that's a small baby 2000 watt uh 2100 watt table saw and granted it had a very new blade on it um, but it still it got through it you know absolutely no problems so you just have to take yeah. it slow and realize that your blades are going to need sharpening or changing. One of the reasons our woods are very hard is they tend to have a very high silica content. So if you know about yeah. silica, silicon, sand, mm, yeah, 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 that yeah. blunts blades. Even carbide blades can't stand up to it for very long. So yeah, uh, saw doctors and new blade shops uh, generally get a bit of a harder run here in Australia than overseas perhaps. <laughs> Australia isn't really made for people, is it? <laughs> well, Terry Pratchett famously said, you come to Australia where everything is trying to kill you except for a few of the sheep. But double check the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. I, I think you can say the same for uh, Norway and Sweden. I mean, they're, they're not very habitable either, really. I mean, what is it at the moment, Havard? Minus 15. <laughs> yeah, well, it's... <laughs> Okay, if you go and lay down on the ground outside, you you will freeze to death. But it it can't be compared. Not if you're properly clothed. No, uh, and of course that that was one of the. I've had some friends going to Australia many years ago, and then I went there myself as a friend in 2010. And of course, coming from Scandinavia, we're we're used to going outside camping, and of course uh, this is a flat, nice spot, and you just lay down. And of course, when we went to Australia, uh, we were told to not sleep outside of the car. Um, we got a car without AC. This was the only one available in Sydney on the 1st of January. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, my travel companion, he couldn't stand mosquitoes and I can't really stand heat. So I wanted to sleep with the car door slightly open to get fresh air. And he, of course, was eaten by the mosquitoes. Uh, so we ended up one night on me sleeping outside of the car. And when I got up in the morning to, of course, eat breakfast and throw away some of the garbage, the size of that uh, iguana or snake or whatever was lurking behind the thrash bins. Uh, it really made Joanna. me think twice. Joanna. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, whenever you stop, there was always a sign. Don't don't sleep here. Don't throw food here. And there was signs of uh, every kind of nasty animals. And of course, 
uh, when you're doing a road trip with your friends, of course, you have to stop every once in a while to to take a leak. And of course, you're doing the decent thing. You're going as far into the bushes as you can. And of course, you're standing there doing your business and then you're looking up and there's like this fist size spider just right in <laughs> a colorful spider uh, right in the front of you. And like, OK, um, we should really start rethinking this. So that's OK. The, the colorful ones aren't poisonous. Okay, good to know. <laughs> the ones you can't see, those are the ones. <laughs> yeah. And the, go- the goannas aren't poisonous, technically, but they eat dead stuff, So, and they are aggressive. And if they bite you, you have to go to hospital because their mouth is so full of bacteria, they'll basically give you gangrene uh, if yeah. they manage to bite you. Oh, and we have poisonous mammals too. I think they're the only poisonous mammals in the world. So, Yeah. I, I remember <laughs> we went there, of course, uh... Uh, to see the fireworks on New Year's Eve. So we started out in Sydney. Um, and of course, we went out from there uh, on a rental car. And then, of course, uh, we hit the first beach that we saw. It was real, like it was kilometers of kilometers of like white snowy beaches. And we just like, stop here. And then we started running. Uh, we did not really reflect on why there wasn't any people at the beach. <laughs> Um, this close out of Sydney. So we started running. Uh, We were half naked before we hit the water. And there was this guy running. And he was waving and screaming like, what's his problems? All right, let's let's just hold on and see what he's uh, on about. And then he's he's a lifeguard. The only one, the only person in uh, miles. I'm like, don't go in the water. Haven't you read the signs? And I'm like, what signs? And then we started looking around. Yeah, there, okay, there are signs here. Don't go in the water. It's like, uh, uh, what's it called? Not manatees, but uh, the the Portuguese warships and all those uh, floating Blue nasty stuff. Blue yeah. bottles, we call them. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, we realized, oh, that's the season. So you had this pens which you could swim in. And if you, if not, of course, we went diving on the Great Barrier Reef and you had to have a full cover-up um, and then, of course, it, it was really nice reading those signs because they had all kinds of the nasty things in the water that could kill you. And FYI, shark was not one of them. And it was like, <laughs> and they described the symptoms. All right, if you got stung by this one, you would feel like this. And when in so-and-so minutes, you would have to do this and that. And, of course, call the emergency <laughs> services. And then all the sign had like these two liter bottles of uh, ammonia or something that you could put on uh, to like relieve the pain. And then as you move down the list, I think it was from the two or third bottom ones. It didn't even say call the emergency services. It was like respiratory (laughs) stop within 20 seconds and paralysis and then drowning. So it's like you could just as well just put down call the coroner because you're dead before anyone can help you. So we realized we went there at the completely wrong season. So we did go to a lot of fantastic beaches no people but we could not swim which was the main reason two norwegian pale fellas went to australia in the first place <laughs> and it's okay they, not um, to mention everything they only come out in the summertime all yeah. those poisonous things only come out in the summer they don't know why you'd want to go to the beach in the summer yeah and, and that's the problem you come here in, in summer, june yeah. you're fine yeah but then it's summer in Norway, so that, why do we want to go to a hotter place? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, learning by doing. But people that say that we said, like to joke about Australia being dangerous, but I would much rather have. I mean, it's probably what you grow up with. I would much rather know that there is, you know, a deadly snake two meters away from my tent that isn't going to bother me unless I go do something stupid, than know there there is a you know five hundred kilo grizzly bear walking around outside my tent who may or may not be hungry. So. The, the North Americans, you know, they got so many predatory animals that can literally eviscerate you. I'd find camping in Canada a much more harrowing experience than camping anywhere in Australia, I think. Yeah. I yeah. think one thing I'm sure is that I wouldn't like to do my job in any other country other than England. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking my head in a flower border and whatnot here is, you know, perfectly safe. I certainly wouldn't do it in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> That... Yeah. Australian gardening is probably a bit different. Than, than <laughs> do, you get, do you get paid danger money? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get paid all right, but um, I recently took over the gardening. <laughs> yeah, I never was a gardener and I still don't profess to be yeah. one. I'm a remover of green things and a hacker of lawns at the moment. <laughs> um, 
but long story short, we replaced our lawn because the old gardener killed it and it cost us a fortune. And so we had to fire the old gardener. And we're in we're in northern Sydney, suburban Sydney. Um, and I could not pay someone to come look after the garden of the complex that we live in. Um, I just I couldn't even get someone to quote me a, a price that was you know far too expensive. Um, yeah. We have such a labour shortage here. So I said, right, well, we're paying eight thousand dollars a year to have our garden maintained professionally. I can buy a very nice lawnmower for that. So I did, <laughs> and um, uh, I've taken over the gardening duties here and. Look, gloves, you have to wear gloves, all jokes aside. You know, you wouldn't go digging through leaf litter and things. Uh, we have had poisonous snakes in our garden that we've seen. Not too many, but we are in the middle of suburbia and I still have deadly snakes yeah. in, in the garden. Um, and spiders, like the, the Sydney funnel web is literally one of the, if not the most deadly spider in the world. And they live in tubes, funnel webs. They literally burrow yeah. and they have a funnel shaped web that they then cover in leaf litter. Uh, to sleep in before they go out and hunt. They don't do a, a traditional sort of spider web. And so if you're brushing leaf litter away and you disturb them, they will come out and have a, have a nip at you and that's not a great yeah. experience. So you have to take precautions when you're doing those things. But honestly, the deadliest plant in Australia are the gum trees. You're talking about camping right. Havard, um, sleeping outside. The number one killer of like tourists camping in Australia are the gum trees because they drop branches in the slightest breath of wind, it's just a natural process. And we've had them lance through our roof. Um, so you have like a two inch, 50 millimeter branch recently got blown <laughs> off in a storm and it went through solid ceramic tile. It is it's harder than the tile and, you know, caused a whole bunch of damage to our roof. So you can imagine that hitting someone's chest uh, on a slightly breezy day who happened to take a nap under a gum tree. Um, yeah. Yeah, so even the trees are trying to kill you here. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> You're really selling it. <laughs> it's great. Well, you think of what we do to those poor gum trees. I mean, we cut them down, we put them through thicknesses and table saws. They're just trying to get their yeah. revenge back a bit. <laughs> I yeah. kind of wonder why you've got a labour shortage in Australia, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's so lovely. That explains it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's really fun. I, I saw... Um... I saw an interview here not long ago. I think it was Mike Rowe uh, who had that television show on Discovery about dirty jobs and mm -hmm. labor shortage is a thing here as well. And of course, people doing manual labor, they can't get enough people to actually do a hard day's work. Uh, and that's a bit sad. And we have it here in Norway as well, where people say, well, if you don't, if you don't study or do your homework you'll end up working the trade labors and then they reference <laughs> some trade labor or something and it's really sad uh how that's come around uh, and uh, i hear that okay that's uh, also a thing in australia well, look, I'm, I'm, getting getting yeah look I'm, I'm an academic obviously generally speaking i didn't do any of the trades like all of the woodworky handyman gardening stuff i've taught myself in the past five years i almost never picked up a power tool before i started my youtube channel um I, i'm a scientist by training speaking of dirty jobs we can talk about that later because my job stinks literally <laughs> um but you know i became a handyman through necessity i said we moved into this apartment block um i became one of the managers of the block and we just couldn't get people affordably or reliably so i go well, how hard can it be and I, I taught myself to do the easy jobs and it all grew from there but even look, I, I'm harsh to my gardener. Our gardener, who we fired, was actually fantastic, but he was in his mid-60s. He was a proper horticulturalist. He knew his stuff, but he obviously wasn't pushing the lawnmower anymore. And it was just, he had a problem finding reliable people who cared enough to do a good job. And I loved doing it. And honestly, I could probably leave my very secure, well-paid government job and do handyman and gardening stuff full-time. And I would make more money than I, I get from the government because... If I wanted to advertise my services, I'm sure that there are plenty of people around me who need those sorts of things because of the labor shortage. But being a full-time tradie is hard. Uh, it's it's a lot of tough work. I like my own my lawn once every two weeks. If I had to do it every single day, <laughs> it becomes less enjoyable uh, and, and more of a chore. And did we mention it gets to 40 plus degrees centigrade here. So doing that uh, with a lawnmower is not, is not terribly fun either. 
So yeah, I feel you. It's it's a challenging thing. But if my daughter, my brand new daughter, if she turns around and tells me she wants to go into the trades instead of into university, I'll be fully supportive of that. It's it's a good life, and more people need to consider that it's a a worthwhile thing. You don't need to have three masters and a PhD to make meaningful contributions to this world. And I, I'm, I'm I'm actually a, a victim of that because I was told all the way that all right, if you want to be an engineer, you have to go the academic road. And then, of course, the university I studied at, they also have like a, a way in for people coming from the trades where they do take some uh, extra curriculum activities uh, in like the summertime. And then they come in and they study in parallel with people coming right out of high school. And then the experience that they bring to the table, they were way ahead of us going directly from high school because they had tried machining they have tried woodworking and anything and they have worked for a couple of years because they got before they got their trade certificate and then they went studying and they were way better studying <clears throat> students than the rest of us and i feel really bad because if like you said if any of my kids want to go into the trades hell yes that's that's a security and then you can go on study whatever you want afterwards mm. But then if someone says to them, and they still kind of do in high school, like, all right, they, they want you to go the academic route, but then it's harder going back the trade route than the other way. Mm -hmm. And of course, not everybody have the mindset of how hard can it be and just go on and trying it and figure out, <laughs> okay, it might not be as hard, but so yeah, that's a, that's a thorn in the side to the educational system, at least here in Norway. So uh, there's still, I think that's universal, like fa well, favorizing podcasts, the academics. The mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm a STEM person, literally. And um, again, Steve Ramsey's uh, does a podcast on this. And he was talking to the honest carpenter, uh, who is a you know a professional tradie and, and a YouTuber. And he said, America's the same. They spent the past 20 years pushing STEM, 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 but it's come at a cost where you know, they're about to go off a cliff over in North America of certain trades because the old guys are getting older and they're simply are not the young people coming through to replace them. Uh, and I said, I, I learned my trade in inverted commas, hashtag fake trading out of necessity. And it's a bit of a problem because I said, I've, I've got a growing family. We're in a small unit here and we won't be here forever. We'll have to move up when we need more size. And currently I'm very worried that when I move out of here and stop doing all the things that I'm doing, that trying to find someone reliable to do those trade to do the gardening to do the handyman even to manage the building is going to be cost prohibitive or impossible because there just aren't the people who are interested in doing that sort of work yeah if you get rid of some of the scary creatures there i'll come over <laughs> like a lot of fun. Mate, i like the you, heat as well <laughs> you, you joke glenn but even it, it extends yeah. through um moving off the the trade side into the professional field um, we might as well take the conversation this way. It was the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, was I work for the police over here. Um, so my real job is in crime scene. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about sort of the ramifications of that towards the end. But the Queensland police, our friends up to the north, they are so short-staffed and trying to encourage young people to join the police force, which is a very secure, very well-respected, generally speaking, um, quite well-paid job that they have gone to England and other places with, you know, those, um, you know, those little mopeds that go around with the giant billboards on the back yeah. of them. They literally are driving around London and other places with come join the Queensland police. We'll pay for your, you know, uh, your flights wow. and with these sunny pictures of the Gold Coast. They're, they're obviously targeting yeah. existing London bobbies and, and people who have some of that experience behind them and bribing them with sunshine uh, to <laughs> to move to the other side of the world um, to try and get more police officers uh, on the streets. And ironically, they'll probably then shove them out into a 50-degree outback hellhole. But um, hey, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's not just a, it's not just the trades. We've got a labour shortage period here here in Australia. And we're not quite as bad at New South Wales police, but um, uh, I'm not a policeman, I should say. I'm a scientist, civilian working for the police. But amongst my friends who are sworn, the average age of the police officer here would probably be the youngest it's been in a long time because they're drastically having to recruit at the moment to try and keep, keep the numbers up. 
So it's um, it's across all facets of, of labor, really, it seems, that teachers are the same. Um, I've got friends who are YouTubers in design and technology, so woodwork, metalwork teachers. He's advertised three times for a job, full-time paid teacher job, and had almost no applicants to teach kids woodwork uh, in, in Sydney. Very sad. Wow. <laughs> While we're on the subject of jobs, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you actually do as you, in your role? So I poke dead bodies with sticks would be the, uh, the, the <laughs> quickest way of, of doing it. Do they ever um, bite back? Uh, there, there is one funny story I can't tell you but the time that did happen. But um, So obviously I need to be a little bit careful here. But um, I, sort of, I warn KJ that I don't usually yeah. discuss um, my professional life, like you could go through until recently when I, I did a video sort of saying what my educational background was in forensic science, I very much separated my professional life and my woodworking life because for obvious reasons, I can't talk a lot about what I do specifically uh, in terms of the cases and things. But the short version uh, for anyone that makes sense, I'm a CSI um, without the Ray-Bans and leather jackets. Uh, we do <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so we do crime scene work and yes, that involves some like violent sort of crime and things, but honestly, the vast majority of what we do is deceased persons. So when somebody passes away and there is nobody around to witness that person passing away because they live by themselves, um, or, uh, they've committed an act of self harm that automatically becomes a crime scene. And our job nine times out of 10 is just to walk into that crime scene and go, yes, nothing suspect happened here. You know, yeah. their wallet is next to them. The windows are locked. Um, you know, they're an old person with three different types of cancer. You know, there's, there's no, nothing here that needs a criminal investigation. So that, that is most of my job. So uh, it's a very necessary job. It's a very fulfilling job, uh, but also it's the sort of job where you can go to university and study forensic advanced chemistry like I did for four years. You can go through all of the training. You can get signed up. You can get ready for it. You can walk into your first crime scene and walk out and never return to the job. It doesn't matter how clever you are or how much life experience you have. There is it's a sort of job where some people can do it and some people cannot. And so that makes us yeah. a relatively rare breed. Uh, and how long you can do it for is also uh, a big thing. So as I said, I'm a civilian, but half of the crime scene people with New South Wales police are sworn. Uh, in other words, they are real police officers. They have the gun and powers of arrest. So we're at 50-50. And the good thing for them is that if they ever burn out from, quite frankly, the horrendousness that we have to witness on a daily basis, they have other parts. They can go back to being a normal, in inverted commas, police officer. They can go to highway patrol. They can go to you know, uh, general duties, detectives, whatever their interest takes them to get away from dealing with what we deal with. Whereas a civilian, I don't have that option. I I am in my job and that is my job. If I wanted to change jobs, I literally have to change jobs. I'd have to move somewhere else to a, a different company, as it were. So the reason I decided that I would like to talk about this today, um, whereas I haven't really mentioned it much before, is that it brings up a really nice bridge to one of the main reasons that I continue to woodwork. As I said, I started out of necessity. We needed a handyman for the building and I learned how to do that. But the woodworking side of it is much more for me. And I see it as preventative health care because while I think I'm fortunate that I am one of those people that does not currently, nearly 10 years in, seem to be long-term affected. Obviously, in the moment, you can be very affected by a job that you're doing, but I don't take it home with me. At least I don't think so. But PTSD is a very real thing. Um, burnout is a very real thing. And it can be that you can feel fine for a very long time and then suddenly not be. Uh, my mate, Brian, uh, from Brian's Builds and Outdoors, another nice little Australian YouTube channel, he was in the armed forces and then he was a police officer. So while he wasn't in crime scene, he would have to attend crime scenes. And I encourage every single male, and I'm being purposely sexist here, because this is a, a male-dominated uh, issue in terms of what we're dealing with. He put a video out this week um, about his struggles, and it was moving me to tears, literally. Um, I put a video up shortly after, and I, I'd encourage anyone particularly in that middle-aged male bracket, that's who the video is for, 
because we suck at talking about our mental health and we suck even more about doing anything about it. And his story, I hope, is dramatic enough, but luckily with a happy ending, um, to move people who are struggling, whether it's through work, family life, or just general malaise, to seek help, to get help. And I can make that statement qualified because while I've had acute stresses so far after 10 years of doing nasty stuff, I think I'm pretty good. And I know I'm pretty good because I have compulsory head checks three times a year. I'm forced to see a psychologist three times a year and I love them. I absolutely, I've never would have been that person to seek out mental health help. And it's for us preventative. It is going there to make sure three times a year that we are still in a good place. We can talk about the bad sort of peaks and troughs, but if there are any warning signs, then the psych will pick those up and have the resources behind to deal with them. And um, yeah, it's the woodworking didn't start out being that bridge for me, but now I am very painfully aware that it is one of the best preventative things that I can do. It's one of the things that when I leave my job, I can leave my job going to the workshop and even though it's not on purpose, that process of having a very hands-on, tactile, creative hobby is something that will allow me to keep doing my job for hopefully another 10 or 20 years um, and stop me from having the burnout and stop me from having those peak crises due to the general horrible nature of what I deal with in a professional life. So that was a bit of a monologue and thank you for, for listening and said, please, <laughs> blokes, I mean, women too, but blokes particularly, go check out Brian's video. Uh, and if it does ring any bells for you, uh, then reach out to people who know what they're on about professionally uh, to get some help. And there is nothing wrong with having a chat. And trust me, you will love it. We all love talking about our making. So going to see someone and talking about how you're making is <laughs> helping your head. You'll, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks, James. I... I actually watched Brian's video and I have uh, friends and family um, in the exact same situation as he is, who's uh, uh, been in the services and of course witnessed things that you, you might not want to talk about with regular people. And <laughs> going a bit back to Australia, I think while my friends and peers were looking to um, Baywatch, uh, when we were growing up, I was uh, looking towards Water Rats um, from Sydney, the television show. And How did I don't that know. Make it to Norway. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, but that was a thing. And I watched it religiously, and it probably made something to me because I worked for uh, the Water Rescue Service in Norway for many years. Oh. And of course, we, we do get to be first at various uh, accidents and so on. And luckily, I haven't been to the worst of them, uh, but I have close friends who have actually turned up to some horrific accidents. And this being a volunteer service, it's, it's a lot of people from, they're working as nurses or doctors or firemen and so on. So they have like a very broad specter of experience, which is good when you're doing water rescue and the stories that have been told. And of course we have received training from um, uh, healthcare professionals and so on. And what I is left with is the importance of talking. I mean, yes, we have psychiatrists uh, on call uh, when you need it. Uh, but the most important thing that we have learned is that the crew which was on site, have the same experiences, talk it through. Of course, you can get all the help that you want, but to talk with someone who's been in the same situation really helps. And of course, that, those situations might not translate to everything else, but I've had, I've lost friends to suicide. Um, yeah. I have people that has opened up after many years of struggling and it might be coming out of the closet or whatever but just burning in with something is really hurtful so i've always tried in every setting to say that just talk to someone i mean it could be your dog uh, that helped for me when i lost my father i was unemployed and we recently got a dog and that dog 
helped me through because I had someone there around me that I could talk to. And of course, uh, well, shout out to my wife who really helped me through that. But seeing a lot of people struggling and how it really helps opening up. I've always tried to position myself that I might not know you, but if you need to talk, I will always listen. And of course, uh, talking about this in a work setting and so on, it's um, it's hard when someone are opening up to you, what do you do? But very often you don't have to do anything. It's the act of listening is really a great step. So if someone is opening up to you, you might feel helpless. What do I say? What do I do? But the most important is to just listen. And then, of course, there are professionals out there who are trained in this. And, of course, then you can say that, uh, all right, there are people here that can help you. And obviously you need that. And if you want, I can look into it. If you need pointers of where to call or something, of course, I'm not a healthcare professional, but I think that's uh, very important. And I learned that I come from a long line of where people, we don't talk about feelings. Uh, like mm-hmm. my father uh, never talked about feelings. And we had like this standing joke that we knew what the other one was thinking by just sharing a look. And of course, that was fun until he passed away. And I realized that was just a load of crap because we didn't talk about the important stuff. And of course, having children on my own, that really shifted my focus because I took a stance that I'm not going to be that person not talking about my feelings, both ups and downs. So I want my children to learn through seeing that in their father that it's okay to talking about the ups and the downs. I'm not going to be a strong father figure, that strong silent type, which is very stereotypical because that doesn't help anyone bringing it full round when I um, posted my video in which I was fairly obviously emotional when I was reacting to Brian's and asking people to go and look at it within minutes of that video going out. I had four or five people from the Australian maker community reach out to me asking me, am I okay? Because in that moment I wasn't okay. I am generally speaking that it was fairly clear in that moment I was not okay because his video had affected me so much. And there were a couple of my, my friends, but then there were three strangers. And I say strangers, they're followers of mine. And I, I recognize the handle from Instagram or that, but there were three strangers to me, people I wouldn't know their first name, wouldn't know them in the street, who reached out after I posted that video within minutes with genuine uh, care for a bloke that they have seen build crappy stuff out of bed slats on the internet and ask me how I was going. And that nearly brought me to tears again. And, um, you know, I had a couple of, you know, good conversations with these people, ensuring them that, you know, while in that moment I was uh, a bit down, that, you know, generally speaking, I'm traveling all right. And um, I hope that other communities around the world can have that as well. Um, and I said, it's not to blow too much smoke up the arse of the Australian woodworking community. We have our challenges as well. But that was just you know, it, it's it's good having having the dog and having the family. And for us at work, because we're all going through the same thing, like all of us are going to horrendous stuff that most people should never have to deal with. So we constantly have people to talk to at work. Sometimes it can mean even more for a, a person you don't know to show that they care because you can talk to people you don't know perhaps more openly, ironically, in some ways than to people you do. Like I wouldn't come home and unload a stress on my wife about, something that I'd done at work because I don't want her to have to, you know, relive what I just went through that's caused me this anguish. Um, whereas, you know, you can have those more open conversations sometimes. So I think if you're ever worried about, if you see someone who, you know, and, and you think that they're struggling, just do reach out, send them a quick direct message and just say, hi, how are you doing? I noticed recently, blah, 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 that it seemed like you're on a bit of a down. Would you like to unload? Um, that can that can be just as important as unloading yourself is is reaching out to others. Very much true. It feels like we should round off the the episode at this point, mate. I, I think we're just we're at that really beautiful downer that you guys are so famous for finishing your episodes on. Um, so <laughs> yeah. it's absolutely appropriate time. We haven't mentioned any weapons yet, though. We will have to do that in the after tour. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> sounds, sounds like a plan. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me, guys. Um, I realise I dominated the mic as I, I like to do because you know I hate the sound of my own voice. But um, it's been a, a real pleasure <laughs> being on here and chatting about uh, a few of those things, particularly at the end. I think it's an important topic, which is getting more coverage now. But you know, yeah. it can almost never have enough. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on, James. Okay. Thank it you. It was great having you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>